But good morning, everybody. Um, it's great to be back at Pembrokeshire Archaeology Day, even though it's uh, an online event, but lovely to see those things. After Harold's talk about relatively recent archaeology, we're going to take you way back in time to the Neolithic period, somewhere between about 4000 BC and 2500 BC, even further back than the monument that's sitting behind me on the screen at the moment. We're going to talk about what's generally referred to as chamber tombs or megalithic tombs, they're sometimes referred to as. And in Pembrokeshire, we've got rather a lot of them. Back in the 1990s, uh, Chris Thompson Barker listed something like 58 of these monuments across Pembrokeshire, of which 31 at that time he found to be still extant. These, these are important monuments. What's especially important about them is that they are part of a much bigger distribution of monuments, which extends right the way across Northwest Europe from Spain and Portugal in the West, all the way through to Scandinavia and the Baltic coastlands in the East. And of course, what's been happening over the last few years is that research has been going on right across that area and has been looking at monuments, some of which are similar to what we find in Pembrokeshire and some of which are a little bit different. We now recognize that there's a lot of different types of megalithic tomb, and indeed the word chamber tomb or the word megalithic tomb is really wholly inadequate to describe what is actually a complicated set of structures which have different cultural connections, different dates to them, and indeed different purposes. We shouldn't assume, for example, that they are all in fact tombs. Well, as I said, Pembrokeshire has a very rich assemblage of these. Some of them are quite familiar to us, some are a little bit less so. And what Luke and I are going to do today is just talk you through some of these monuments, talk you first through some of the familiar ones, and then we're going to have a look at some of those which are a bit less familiar and which are emerging as an interesting new group. And Luke's going to describe some field work that he's been carrying out on those sites. So let's start with the familiar. If we have the next slide, Luke. We're going to take you into a few areas. Some of these tombs really are all about raising up big stones. And a group of monuments that we refer to as propped rocks start off our account today. Uh, here's a rather nice one down at the King's Coit, of course. This is where a big slab of stone has simply been raised up out of the ground and propped up at one end. And we find these sites not only in Pembrokeshire, but across the southwest of Britain. Um, there's quite a few examples in Devon and Cornwall, for example. And there's probably a few further north too. These are another group or one group which is being relatively recently recognized for what it is. And it's all about the stone. There may be burials underneath, but it's all about the stone above. And the same applies to the next group. We have the next slide, Luke. Um, here we see simple dolmens. You can see on the map on the left-hand side where the examples that we know of in Pembrokeshire are. And we see a nice example there at Carrick Sampson. Here again, we've got a big stone, a big rock, which has been lifted up out of the ground and set up on these uprights. There is a pit or there was a pit underneath it and perhaps some burials, but burial is not a particularly important part of these sites. And we find them very widely scattered again across the west of Britain. Some of our dolmens are a little bit more complex. We have the next slide. We find what are often referred to as portal dolmens. And here's a very nice example at Kerry Coyton. Um, and you see here that we've got a big stone on the top again. We've got the uprights supporting it, but now we've got a flat slab at the front, almost like a doorway leading into an area underneath the stone. But again, it's all about the stone rather than the chamber underneath it. And to call these chamber tombs is, is probably something of a misnomer. One of the most familiar types of monument right across Europe, though, is the Long Barrow. If we have the next slide, Luke, we've got a couple of these in Pembrokeshire, of which by far and away the most famous is here at Pentra Ifan. We've got some plans on the right hand side there. And you see the Long Barrow at the bottom of a series of plans which represent the development of this site over quite a long period of time. Long barrows are amongst the most widespread type of tomb that we have during the fourth millennium BC. So from about 4,000 BC down to about 3,500 BC, right across Western Europe. And what's interesting about many of them is that they are the culmination of a series of phases of development on the same site. And this is what we see exactly happening at Pentra Ifan. In its earlier life, it was a portal dolmen and there was some structures on the site even before that. And then it was converted into a long barrow a little bit later on. Next slide, please. Because 
equally famous across Northwest Europe, we have a series of monuments which we refer to as passage graves. Um, big sites like Newgrange in, in Ireland are very well known, but there are also a series of passage graves which comprise multiple passages leading into chambers at the in the end of or at the circumference of a round or a long mound. And these are quite common in Normandy, in the Isle of Man, for example, in the west of Scotland. And we have this one here at Kerikikor in, uh, in Pembrokeshire. And this is a nice example looking out over the sea and, and a very good example of its type. Now, all of these are very familiar kind of monuments, as we've said. But some sites are emerging, which are a lot less familiar. If we have the next slide, Luke. We have a series of monuments which are referred to as gallery graves. Now, these haven't been very widely recognized in the area before, and we're starting to see a few examples, and we can recognize something of their significance. And I'm going to hand over now to Luke to talk about some of the fieldwork that goes with the exploration of these sites. I think you're on mute, mute Luke. We can't hear you anyway. How's that? That's better. That's better. OK, uh, so what are gallery graves? Well, they're another form of megalithic tombs, uh, as Tim has been describing, which appear at the very end of the Neolithic. And they occur, occur across much of Europe. Um, I'll leave uh, that till the end. And Tim's going to talk a bit more about where they occur. Um, but they often have cigar like mounds. Um, and a boxed or transepted chamber, um, which is often inaccessible. So these were, could have never been walked down in many instances. All of the examples we know of in Pembrokeshire are located on the Preseli Ridge. You can see two of them highlighted here. There is a third that we're going to talk a little bit about today. So the most famous of these is Bear the Ravank. Um, it is located fairly central in uh, in Berrien Bog. If anyone wants to visit this, I would advise wellies and a phone at all times because it is very, very wet. And it was excavated in the 1920s by W.F. Grimes, who unfortunately was very early in his career and he never published it. Nevertheless, he did leave behind a fairly substantial archive, which we have subsequently scoured through. So this tomb is very much as, the, as fits the brief of a gallery grave. It has a long chamber, which is again boxed, as we described, and has a cairn which roughly hugs the shape of the monument. You can see here uh, Grimes' slightly bonkers 1930s trench plan, which was very much vogue at the time. Um, and what he also found was a really nice peat, peaty soil underneath, which I'd love to get my hands on one day. Um, subsequently, uh, the Spaces project went back and they did a nice geophysical survey and, and confirmed that there's not much beyond the limit of the, ex um, the, the excavation. Um, and to be honest, not a huge amount has been done since. So in the subsequent time, people have continued walking over the Priscelli Ridge, notably uh, Pete Druitt um, from UCL in the 1980s who found a very similar monument at Bank Lloyd Loss, which is about a kilometer to the west of Bear the Ravank. This monument, again, is, has a long, narrow chamber, seemingly with hints of a transept, and is of roughly the same proportion. It was properly characterized uh, by uh, Fran Murphy and Hubert Wilson in 2012, and subsequently we went back to do some geophysical survey um, in the intervening years. We found faint hints of a mound, uh, very similar to Bear the Ravank, and a possible chamber at its southern end. Also really nicely defined that wall with a um, topographical survey. The final candidate has come to light only recently, um, when I found it recorded on the HER, and had been pointed out to me several times since, and that is Penanti Isav, or a possible gallery grave at Penanti Isav, which again seems very similar in character to Bank Lloyd Loss and Bear the Ravank. Uh, we haven't done any work on this, I've gone out to draw it, but again it's got this, this slight mound that hugs it, 
and this box-like chamber arrangement. So looking at all three of them together, you can see that they are very similar. And if they are, they would uh, represent a very westerly distribution uh, of, of these tombs um, and adds a new dimension to quite a, quite a previously thought to be understood distribution of tombs across Pembrokeshire. Back to you, Tim. Thanks, Luke. Well, we can see there some, some really nice examples of a, a kind of monument which is very much more widespread. On the map, we can see the territories where they occur. They're very well known, for example, to the south in Brittany and across into Normandy, and you've got a selection of plans there. They're found in the Paris Basin, where they're often associated with the so-called Seinois Marne culture, and we find them in Western Germany as well. Again, you can see some plans of examples there. They're also quite widespread in Scandinavia, although like our British examples, it's in Scandinavia that they're starting to realize that they have examples of this, but perhaps hadn't really recognized them as a separate group, which, um, which is rather important. So there are a lot of, of examples up in uh, Southern Sweden and Denmark and on the islands in the Baltic as well. And uh, if you press the button, Luke, we can recognize that we've got our example here in Pembrokeshire examples coming through in Pembrokeshire too. Now, as Luke mentioned, these are relatively late Neolithic tombs. They tend to occur in the period from about 3,200 BC down to about 2,900 BC. Many of those which have been excavated on the continent do include burials, quite large numbers of burials in some cases, up to hundreds of individuals in a few examples. We're not going to find that in West Wales because, of course, the soil conditions are not conducive to finding human remains unless they're cremated. But nonetheless, these are likely to be megalithic tombs with a burial purpose to them. So these are really, really nice uh, examples. In due course, I hope we'll be able to sample some of the uh, sites that Luke's just identified with us and perhaps get some material to date from underneath them. That would be very nice. And we also need to look out for more examples because where there's three, there's likely to be more. And I suspect there's other examples out there to find. What all of this shows is that the understanding of our megalithic tombs in Pembrokeshire and the far west of, of Britain more generally, has to adapt and change to the new results of research that are going on, not just in our area, but actually across the whole of Northwest Europe. And when we contextualize our sites in that bigger framework, we realize that there's some really interesting cultural relationships going on here. There's some really interesting development of megalithic structures going on here. And we find that communities in our area are very well connected with a lot of other communities across Northwest Europe. So I think we'll leave it there. Thank you for listening. And uh, I hope we've interested you in what we've been working on. And do let us know if you spot some other examples, because we'd love to come out and have a look.